Hey guys, it's Celestia, and after like a year of saying I'm gonna make a video talking about the problems with zines, I'm finally talking about the problems with zines. There are a couple reasons that I waited, and while most of them have more to do with me having more video topics than time and months worth of other shit getting between me and my ability to make them than anything else, it's also partially because I wanted to gather as much information as I possibly could about it, ideally from first-hand experience rather than hearsay or the perspective of an outsider looking in. And in fairness, I did have a reasonable amount of first-hand experience before, given that I'd participated in several zines and run my own basically by myself, which <laughs> is a mistake I'll get into more later. But for the most part, my first-hand experiences with zines were generally pretty positive. Which will probably prompt the question, what the f*** is your problem with them then, if the zines that you were in went well, which is fair. And the answer is basically just that the problems I saw happening more and more in the zine community were happening in zines that I wasn't a part of. And like, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that you have to have first-hand experience with a problem to comment on it if you've done research into it, which is precisely why I was going to make a video about it before, just having seen and looked into those problems before dealing with them myself. But I did feel like in this particular case, it would be beneficial to try to get some more hands-on insight. To put it bluntly, I wanted to give the general zine community that I was seeing those problems grow in the benefit of the doubt, because the way it looks externally isn't always the way it really is. So I did a little... Calling it an experiment makes it sound a little more disingenuous than it really was, but it's the closest applicable term, really. I applied to about 20 zines in the summer of 2021, half of which were within a fandom that I'd seen a lot of problems in, at least in terms of zines, and half of which were just random with topics and subject matter that I was interested in. And it sounds dishonest because it makes it seem like I was just doing it for research purposes and had no interest in the zines themselves, but I didn't apply to any zine that I wouldn't have been happy to participate in. And I actually did end up actively contributing to two of them. But I was also gathering information, and now that I feel like that's given me a more developed perspective on the issue, I'm finally getting around to putting those thoughts into a video. But before I actually share those thoughts with you, I'd like to give some kind of a background into zines, their history, my experiences with them, and what led me to looking into this in the first place. Because I recognize that while zines are a pretty well-known thing at this point, I'm sure there are still quite a few people out there that aren't familiar with them, or at least are unfamiliar with some of the issues surrounding them. By definition, zines are small circulation, self-published works of original or appropriated texts and images, and are the product of either a single person or a very small group of people. It's a non-professional and non-official publication produced by enthusiasts of a particular cultural phenomenon for the pleasure of others who share that interest. While I don't believe there's an actual limit on how many copies of a zine can exist before it stops being considered a zine, uh, they generally have runs with less than a thousand copies and frequently even less than a hundred, which is part of the appeal of them because the limited availability kind of commodifies them. God, it feels so good to be able to quote Wikipedia. I think that's one of the most telling moments where it's like, oh shit, I'm an adult. Because literally no one has the power to stop me from using that godforsaken site as a source and paraphrase from it anymore. It's freeing. I feel like I finally stuck it to my high school teachers after all this time. Like, f you, Mrs. O. Your pantsuit was tacky, and maybe you should have been less focused on taking my phone for reading gay fanfiction in your class, and more focused on why I was so bored by your class that I wanted to. And because Wikipedia is a valid source that students should be able to use, I'm gonna cite it some more, because I'm a 24-year-old lady and I do what I want. Over time, the one aspect of zines that has remained not only a constant feature, but a defining one in what makes something a zine is not the subject matter, but that the intention behind it is first and foremost to demonstrate creativity, share a niche skill or art, or develop a story or even identity, with the desire to make a profit generally taking a back seat, which is a point I'll touch more on later. Basically, the point was to share your art, whatever its medium or subject matter happened to be, with the world, and more specifically with the community that you're a part of that loves it as much as you do. Which has, like I said, mostly remained the same, despite how significantly the subject matter has changed over the years. Because boy has it changed. While zines these days are more focused on fandom, when they originally started gaining notoriety in the 60s and 70s, that was not the case. As our lord and savior Wikipedia senpai says, Historically, zines have provided community for socially isolated individuals or groups through the ability to express and pursue common ideas and subjects. Zines present groups that have been dismissed with an opportunity to voice their opinion, 
both with other members of their communities or with a larger audience. Which is effectively to say that while even then some zines were just about expressing passion and interest in certain types of media, namely science fiction and punk music and punk culture at that time, they were primarily used as a way for minorities of any and every kind to express their views and opinions through art and writing. Subsequently, while zines these days are mostly limited to compilations of art pertaining to a certain piece of media, at that time a significant portion of them were a lot more politically driven, community driven, and important. I know that's not the right word to use here, because I do love zines as they are now, and I'm not trying to say that working with a group of people who love something you love to create a compilation of art based on it isn't important. But I don't think it's outrageous to say that it's objectively less important than the historical use of that same medium to give minorities a voice. Which is one of the problems that people have with them now. A popular take on them is that people have taken a type of media that was once used to do anything from giving nerds a place to express their love for something without it being mocked, to giving oppressed groups and individuals a platform on which to share their stories, beliefs, and identities. And they've turned it into something vastly more commercialized, corporate, and profit-motivated. Which is the exact same thing that zines originally sought out to fight against. I mean, in the beginning, the people making zines were doing so partially to fight the censorship in publishing houses that were erasing or limiting their voices, interests, or entire communities, and giving these subcultures a do-it-yourself solution that completely bypassed the need for those conventional publishing houses altogether. And zines today are often no different than something that any publishing house probably would be willing to publish based on subject matter alone. And they're being produced with the same, if not superior, production value. Some of them are exceptions to that rule, like zines with focuses on LGBTQ characters or couples, or disabled characters, or characters that are visible minorities, and even the significant number of zines that are still focused on sharing that same type of minority representation and community and awareness as before. And I don't mean to erase that, but the vast majority these days, at least compared to the past, are closer to this character from this thing is hot, we made a book about it. Which is fine, because finding characters hot and making art about it isn't a bad thing. Art doesn't have to have some deeper meaning to have value, and aesthetic attraction doesn't have to be diminished or demeaned for deeper meaning to be significant. They're not mutually exclusive, they can coexist simultaneously. I'm not trying to say that the way that zines have changed is bad, although I will eventually be getting to my opinions on that particular stance, but I'm rather just trying to give you guys some background into their history and development, which means I objectively do have to mention that particular controversy in the process. But with that attempt at a comprehensive history of zines done, let me tell you more about my personal experiences with them. The first zine I participated in was in 2018, which was the Devil's Nest fanzine, a zine based on Full Metal Alchemist, or more specifically on the characters from Full Metal Alchemist that were based out of the Devil's Nest, most notably being Greed and his Chimera Buds. And for a first zine experience, I gotta say, it was fantastic. Everything was done professionally and smoothly, I think almost everyone got their pieces done on time, management was understanding and transparent, and I personally had a fantastic time working with the whole team. It was such a good experience that it motivated me to want to do more like it, and given how hit or miss zines can be, I'm really grateful that my first time doing one was such a positive thing that it did make me want to continue working on similar projects, because it could have just as easily been a shit show disaster that turned me off of zines forever. But it didn't, and the management team was kind enough to actually have several one-on-ones with me after the zine ended, because I reached out to them and asked for their advice on running my own. Which brings me to the second zine experience, the happiness is a choice zine. And first and foremost, no, I don't believe happiness is a choice, I think I've mentioned this before. People have depression, life sucks, you can't choose to be happy when you aren't. You can choose to look at things more positively and make changes to improve your life and mental health, but you can't just wake up and decide, oh. I'm happy now, and have that actually work, otherwise everyone would be doing it, and whatever pharmaceutical company makes Prozac would be out of business in five minutes. Happiness is a choice is actually a frequently used phrase that's commonly attributed to the retro-futuristic horror game We Happy Few, which is still one of my all-time favorite games. It's also the fandom I wanted to make a zine based on, which soon thereafter came to be known as Happiness is a Choice, a We Happy Few fanzine. And you might be thinking it was a little overambitious of me to participate in my first zine and then immediately decide to start my own, from scratch, with no team or experience other than that very first time as a contributor. And you would be right, it was dumb as hell. But I am nothing if not an overambitious workaholic with no semblance of self-control, and while it took like six months worth of all-nighters and a lot of advice from those mods from the Devil's Nest scene, I actually did manage to pull it off. I did technically have two other mods quote-unquote 
running it with me. But both of them were people I had only recently met within the fandom and become relatively okay friends with. And I committed nepotism and poor judgment by offering them roles as mods, exclusively because of that friendship, the fact that they were also big fans of the game, and the fact that they were also artists. And while I won't go into any detail about what ended up happening as a result of that poor judgment, because I did literally just name the zine and it's not hard to find who I'm talking about as a result, I will say that beyond the initial application review process that they were both very helpful with, I basically ended up running the zine alone. Which again, as I mentioned before, I'll touch on more later at the end of the video when I make my conclusions, but suffice it to say that it was a learning experience in which I made four art pieces for the zine itself, two art prints and a full set of buttons for the merch package, did all of the graphic design and marketing, coordinated the finances, and worked with the charity we donated proceeds to, before falling into a month-long coma to the soundtrack of Dan Avedon saying my hubris over and over again. Anyway, while there were certainly some bumps in the happiness is a choice zines road, it turned out to be a project that I'm still really proud of having coordinated and completed, despite the fact that I now look at the art I made for it and see nothing but cringe that I desperately want to fix. And yes, I ended up exhausted as hell and full of regret about the amount of work that I took on. But no, no, I did not learn from that, because the fact that I eventually did end up succeeding despite it gave my dumb f lizard brain the validation it needed to start thinking. Taking on impossible projects is fine if the end result is success. Hence why my next zine experience was completely independent, in which I did two years worth of Inktober prompts, traditionally and digitally, and compiled those into a zine that was completely my own, which is still for sale and currently available on my store, link in the description, shameless plug. Because that was such a thoroughly independent project, I don't have a whole hell of a lot to say about it in regards to this other than that it went well and I'm planning another one. But it did absolutely teach me a valuable lesson about marketing. See, one of the problems with scenes that I'll get into later on in the video is that people running them tend to be far too heavily reliant on the follower counts of the artists participating in them, because that's the only way they're able to actually market the project and sell it. And a lot of people defend that by saying that relying on artists with big followings is the only way to successfully be able to sell a zine. Which is why running a 100% solo, one single artist zine with 300 followers objectively showed me that that was a huge crock of shit. I had no following, no other artists with followings to rely on, and at that point I was even selling it on Big Cartel rather than Etsy, so I didn't even have Etsy's marketplace to drive in external sales. I still managed to not only break even on the project, but make a small profit. It absolutely could have sold much, much better if I had had a following or other contributors promoting it and adding their work to it, yeah. And I'm not trying to claim that there's no benefit marketing-wise to having high follower count participants, but I can say confidently and with the experience to back it up that you don't need that to succeed in any capacity, so long as you're comfortable with and prepared for the fact that it will be a smaller capacity than it would be with a larger following. And that's potentially one of the most useful insights I walked away from that project with, at least in terms of my perspective on zines. Anyway, I finished working on and marketing that zine at roughly the same time that I started YouTube, so my time and focus were largely taken up by the latter instead, and I didn't end up working on any more of them until the experiment. Which sounds dubious and ominous, but if applying to zines for the sake of information with every intention to actually make art for them if I was accepted is the worst experiment I conduct in my life, I'm still better than most historical researchers. Looking at you, Bender. So I'm counting it as a win. But before I go into the results of that experiment, let me tell you about the most significant problems that I've been noticing within the zine community up until that point that led me to do it in the first place. I'll start with the two that I've already mentioned to some extent, which are the follower-reliant marketing and the increasingly corporate, commercial nature of the zine community, starting with the former. Now, to be clear, relying on the follower counts of project participants is not inherently problematic in and of itself. I mean, that's literally why sponsors exist, fundamentally, and god knows I've had my share of recent positive experiences with those. It's just good business in the year 2022 to have people with a lot of followers promote the thing you're selling, which is why everyone does it. As a marketing consultant, I literally cannot bash that without making myself an instant instantaneous hypocrite. 
But if you can't sell your product at all without having a high-profile person promote it, it is a problem. And unfortunately, it seems that in the zine community, that's become kind of the standard. And not only is that detrimental to the people running those zines, because they're failing to appeal to a wider market through their own marketing campaigns, it's significantly more detrimental to the zine participants, because it results in follower-based favoritism. If a zine's success is entirely dependent on the number of followers its participants have, the people running the zine are naturally going to select applicants with higher numbers of followers based on those numbers rather than their art skills. Which reminds me of the fact that I still haven't actually explained how zines technically work now, so quick break for a rundown of that. Generally, when one mod or a team of mods decides to start a zine, they'll run an interest check, at which point the community they're targeting will have the opportunity to fill out a form or something similar, indicating whether or not they would buy the zine that they want to make, and whether or not they would want to contribute to it. If that interest check yields positive results, the zine generally goes into the application phase, at which point the mods will open applications to the community who can then submit their pitches and artwork for consideration. In an ideal world, those applications will be judged based on how good the artist's work is, and how well that work would translate to the subject matter of the zine. In the real world, those applications frequently seem to be judged based on how many followers the applicants have. To the point that many zines actually ask you to disclose your follower count in the application. And even if they don't, they do always ask for your social media, so it's not like they aren't checking your follower count one way or another anyway. I'm not saying that all zines are biased in this particular way, and many of them have deliberately tried to combat this perception by sharing the follower statistics of their participants, to show that follower counts weren't being considered. But while that's absolutely a good thing, it doesn't negate the fact that the vast majority of zines do appear to be demonstrating that bias. In terms of the next issue, the increasingly corporate and commercial nature of zines, that's more complicated. As I've already said, I am personally of the belief that the purpose zines served historically is more important than the purpose they're serving now. Which is to say that I believe giving minorities a voice is more important than expressing and sharing passions regarding a certain topic. But that doesn't mean that expressing and sharing passions isn't important in and of itself. And while I don't think that anyone arguing against modern zines in this capacity is suggesting otherwise, I do feel like modern zines are at a disadvantage to some extent, which I'll explain in a second. Basically, this problem is twofold, and please hear that in the voice of a 50s politician on a shitty black and white TV, because I'm pretty sure that's the last time someone unironically said the word twofold. Uh, by which I mean that half of the people that have a problem with modern zines in this regard are concerned with the corporate nature because it diminishes the true meaning that zines were initially created to communicate, while the other half have a problem with them because of the profit-driven mentality that's motivating them. And as a result, I have to discuss both sides separately. The people that feel that zines have lost their meaning and significance because they're no longer used for the much more notable and important purposes of the past, feel like the fact that modern fans are using that form of media to produce works that are motivated exclusively by aesthetic or attraction-based interests is reducing and diminishing the impact of what zines used to be. And while I completely understand this perspective, I also think it fails to acknowledge one very important point that things change and develop over time, and just because they don't have the same meaning and value that they used to, does not mean they have no meaning or value. The reason that zines became gradually less and less used as a method of speaking out about real issues is primarily that the internet grew in popularity and accessibility, and people were no longer forced to rely on zines to create those spaces for them and their communities. The internet did so better, or at least more easily. It's not that those issues stopped being talked about or that those voices were silenced. It's just that they found a better and more accessible, widespread platform to use. So if zines don't need to be used for that anymore, why should they be bashed for finding a new use instead? Yes, a zine dedicated to fan art and writing about Kaya from Genshin Impact being pretty is objectively less meaningful than a zine about, like, women's rights and inequality issues. But does a zine have to have some deeper meaning to have value? If you're gonna compare it to that, then current zines are always gonna seem irrelevant. I mean, women's rights and inequality issues are still being discussed through different venues, so it's not like making a zine about Kaya is gonna erase or talk over those more important topics. It's just people enjoying something they enjoy and using a form of media to share that with other people who enjoy it. Which, for the record, is still one of the main reasons that zines came to exist in the first place. Some of them were dedicated to giving nerds a space in which their interests could be enjoyed and shared rather than mocked and belittled. And that's an important part of zine history that is still in practice today, even with the more superficial of zine topics. 
People shouldn't have to justify why they like something enough to make art of it. And art shouldn't have to have meaning to have value, which is really its own can of worms that I'll open more in another video. But the other side of this argument, in my opinion, has a lot more validity. People who don't like the more corporate form that zines have taken because they've become more focused on profit than art are, in my opinion, very right to be critical of that. Zines, at least when they first came to be, were intended to be a medium through which any artist or creator could share their work with their communities and the world. And back then, creativity always came first. It didn't matter how well the zine was produced. In fact, they were normally just made on copier paper and stapled together, with no intention to try to meet professional standards for production value. Production value wasn't the point. Art was the point. And the same went for sales. A lot of the time, zines were passion projects that were either distributed for free or sold for very low prices. And if they were being sold for a price at all, it was only ever to pay for the project's expenses and break even so that the creators could afford future projects too. But if you look at zines today, they're usually a pretty far cry from that. Frequently created with the same production value as most serialized comics and sold at price points clearly created with profit in mind often alongside merch packages that primarily, at least from a marketing standpoint, exist to drive sales. It's not hard to look at how zines have changed and see why people might have a problem with the increasingly capitalistic nature that they've adopted over time. Because it absolutely does seem like the priorities have shifted. It's profit first and passion second, at least on the surface. And I know that that doesn't apply to every zine. Many of them are done for charity, at which point the priority being profit is exclusively so that they can make as large of a donation as possible. And even if they're just sold for the contributor's own profit, I don't think that should be demonized either. Artists should be paid for their work, and they shouldn't be demonized or looked down on for wanting compensation for the work that they've put time and effort into. I sell my Inktober zine for profit because I worked really f***ing hard on it and I deserve to make money on a thing that I created and paid to produce. And I do think that a lot of people criticizing this problem need to take that into consideration, because charging a reasonable amount for a product does not mean someone is immediately being a money-grabbing asshole who sold out their creativity and put profit first. You can put passion and creativity first and still be a reasonable human being who realizes that they can't produce a thing based on that passion and creativity without getting paid for it. And taking that into consideration doesn't mean they're putting money ahead of art. And the fact that zines have grown into something profitable with higher production value isn't inherently bad either. Things evolve, printing gets cheaper, technology gets better, and the improvement of a type of media doesn't make it less genuine or meaningful or do-it-yourself just because it's not literally made by hand anymore. But it is worth noting, in my opinion, that while I don't think modern zines should be criticized for charging more or considering profit more seriously, I do think that the corporate nature of them can become problematic when a zine is only created, or primarily created at least, for the sake of making money. I realize that that's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to determine, but it certainly seems like the more zines grow in popularity, the more people are inclined to make a zine based on something, not because they really love that thing, but because that thing is currently popular and they think it'll sell well and make them a lot of money. If you're mostly just making a zine because the subject matter is popular, yeah, I, I do think that's kind of a slap in the face to what zines were created to be. And this ties in well with the next problem I noticed, which was actually brought to my attention by a friend of mine. And it's that it seems like more and more often, people are making zines with particular topics less because they're passionate about them, and more because they want to be the first ones to make that zine. The example this friend gave was a zine about Goro from Genshin Impact. And they brought up this example because that zine launched in July. Goro himself was only released in September. And yes, the fandom had been given some precursory information about him as a character before he was formally released, but not nearly enough for this zine's creators to be out here like, based on these three paragraphs worth of information that we have about him, we love him on such a deep, visceral level that we want to create a zine about him out of pure passion. It's not a big leap to say that making a zine about a character months before they could have any reasonable way to know anything significant about that character is probably motivated more by wanting to be the first ones to make a zine about him than anything else. Especially given that that zine was announced one day after he was shown for the first time for 10 seconds in a trailer. It's a problem that goes hand in hand with the next one that I want to bring up, which is that the zine community has become entrenched in this competitive, exclusive, clicky mentality, which is so far off from what zines are supposed to be. 
an open, community-driven environment in which, whenever possible, everyone is given equal opportunity to participate in them, because the point of them is to share your passion for a thing. But these days, it seems like most zine teams are more interested in running the best zine, the first zine about a particular theme, the most prestigious zine with the most popular and well-liked artists, than actually creating that open and welcoming environment for fans of their theme. And as a result of that, it's become an increasingly common criticism that zines are less like open projects for community participation and more like closed collaborations for popular artists and groups of friends, in which preferential treatment is given to the most valuable artists or the people within those groups of friends. And quite frankly, that's gross. And yet another slap in the face to the whole fucking point of zines. At that point, call it a collab. There's nothing wrong with wanting to work on a project with just your friends or artists that you think will be the most popular or profitable. But don't call it a zine and act like everyone has a fair and equal shot at participating in it, only to pick exclusively the exact group of people you had been planning on letting in from the start. That's scummy. Finally, the last problem I noticed with zines, as of recently, is poor management. And I get it, that's gonna come with the territory when these are projects run by individuals and not professionals. The whole point of zines is to allow amateurs the same opportunities to publish and share their work as professionals. And subsequently, the whole point is that professionalism is not a requirement for zines. But if you're gonna be selling something and actually making money from it, I think there should still be some attempt at it. Because not being a professional doesn't mean you can't try to be professional about your project and the way you're running it. And yet half the zines out there end up being late by ridiculous amounts of time, cancelled altogether, going radio silent for months with no updates or information, or even in some cases, taking the money they were supposed to either donate to charity or split amongst the artists, and disappearing. There's an increasing lack of accountability within the zine community when it comes to professionalism, because people seem to think that just because it's a group of artists working on a thing together, they don't have to be professional about it. But if money is being exchanged and artists are putting their hard work and a lot of time into their pieces for something, there should at least be some semblance of consistent responsibility from the mods running it. And oftentimes that's just not the case. And because these are just individuals on the internet, it can be really hard to even try to hold them accountable for poor management of zines, because nothing is stopping them from just disappearing. So all of that in mind, that brings us to the experiment. Now that you know what prompted me to want to do it in the first place. As I mentioned before, I applied to 20 zines in the summer of 2021, and 10 of them were specifically Genshin Impact zines. This was when Genshin was first rising in popularity, or at least roughly. And as a result of that, it had a community that was growing fast and full of a lot of artists that wanted to make zines about it. Which is a good thing. But compared to literally every other fandom I've seen, I'd been noticing the problems that I just mentioned much, much more often within the Genshin community than anywhere else, and by no small margin either. I imagine this is largely because of both how big the community is and subsequently how many more zines there were about it than most other topics, and the fact that the Genshin community was single-handedly responsible for popularizing zines in a way that other fandoms hadn't. What I mean is that I was looking at these zines from the perspective of someone who had been participating in and consuming them for many years beforehand, but because Genshin got so popular and also had so many fans that wanted to make zines based on it, a huge number of people were being introduced to zines for the very first time through Genshin Impact. Genshin zines were, for many, the first zines that they'd ever seen, participated in, or even run, which seems to have resulted in a sub-community that's very isolated and separate from the larger zine community. The way they run things is very different than anything I've experienced before, which I imagine to be a result of this specific aspect of the way the community formed. And while that's actually kind of cool, it also means they aren't really maintaining the zine standards that the wider community is accustomed to. Which is a nicer way of saying that they don't seem to know what they're doing and have a lot more problems than any other community does in some very obvious, blatant ways. Anyway, the other 10 zines I applied to were just completely random, which I found by looking through the zine application tag on Twitter. They were all based on topics I was interested in because I didn't want to be dishonest and apply for the sake of applying, only to drop out if I got in because I didn't care about or even know about the theme. And of the 20 total zines I applied to, I was rejected from all 10 Genshin zines and accepted into all 10 other zines. Which was... interesting. What made it more interesting was the fact that when looking at those Genshin zines more closely, I noticed two things. One, that the vast majority of applicants that got in had at least 5,000 followers. 
and two, that the mod teams were almost all the same. I don't mean they all had exactly the same mod teams, but in almost every case they had at least two mods in common. Which means that out of ten zines, basically the same group of friends was running all of them. And even in instances in which these people weren't mods of one of the other zines, they were accepted as artists for those zines, even when they had significantly less followers than the high-profile artists that were preferred otherwise. And while I obviously can't objectively confirm that these groups were giving preferential treatment to their friends and applicants with bigger followings, I can at least say that these observations were intriguing. Of the other ten zines that I did get accepted into, five ended up not happening at all and were cancelled before development even started, which was, in most cases, because one or more of the mods, and often many of the artists, got sick with the big sick and that's more than understandable. The fact that I did this experiment during this particular big sickness, and excuse the censorship, but I'm pretty sure YouTube still won't let me say the words. It, it does skew the results a little, but I didn't have an alternative. Anyway, of the five that weren't canceled, I ended up dropping out of one of them due to time constraints and health problems on my end. Uh, I dropped out of another one because they basically told me, we picked you and these other couple artists that we added to this private DM so that you could promote us on social media. Please do that right away. And I I found that to be a repulsive example of the exact follower-based favoritism I had observed. Another one ended up letting the entire team of artists finish their work, only to postpone the zine over and over and over, and then eventually just cancel it altogether, because they didn't have time to produce it after everyone was already done, and the last two are currently in successful production. But even so, one of those successful two still offered artists so many ridiculous extensions that it's now super late, which did little to disprove my observations of poor management, and that was pretty disappointing, honestly. The other remaining successful zine was actually a huge pleasure to work with in every capacity, and I didn't see even one example of the problems I mentioned before, which was vastly less disappointing. So in conclusion, what I learned from the experiment was… well, pretty much that all of the problems I was seeing on the outside of the zine community are just as present on the inside as I expected. The only thing I didn't see firsthand was a lack of financial accountability, but in fairness, the two zines I did end up participating in until production haven't actually opened sales yet, so that could still happen, although I hope it doesn't. I'm absolutely glad that I decided to seek out more hands-on insight into how things were running behind the scenes before making this video, but I'm a lot less glad that I wasn't more surprised by the results. Again, I can't stress enough that a lot of these problems are going to be inevitable when projects are run by independent artists rather than professionals, and that unavoidable aspect isn't even necessarily a bad thing, it's just the nature of zines. And that's okay, mistakes get made, and I'm not saying we should be holding zine mods to the same standards we would hold professional publishers or project runners. Cause that's dumb, for a plethora of very obvious reasons. Zines are awesome because they're not perfect, they're just the culmination of a bunch of people's love for a thing, and that's what's so beautiful about them. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to address some of the bigger problems facing the community, and this experience has shown me that that's more important than ever. More than anything, I think the biggest things that zines need to focus on improving are inclusivity, equality, transparency, and management. It's divisive, clicky, and detrimental to act like all artists have an equal chance to participate in a zine, when in reality only the people with the most followers or an in with the mods get a real shot. And if you're only going to pick your friends or the most popular applicants, at least be honest about what you're doing and call it a closed collaboration. And god, please stop running these things with just your friends. I get it. I do. As I mentioned before, I ran my own zine with two friends, and it was a dumb mistake that went poorly. In that case, it didn't result in any preferential treatment based on who was friends with us, but it absolutely could have, and it very frequently does. Even so, it still meant that those two were invited by me to participate, not out of merit, but because they were my friends. And that was stupid and shitty of me. It also resulted in things being managed more poorly than they could have been, because I was excusing the things that they were doing, or more accurately, not doing, because I didn't want to lose their friendship. Running zines with your friends rather than opening mod applications fairly and reasonably just opens the door to so many problems. Preferential treatment, exclusivity, poor management, lack of accountability, ruined friendships, a lack of professionalism, and even in some cases, mishandling of money. 
I get the appeal, and I'm not trying to say that mods that do this are being deliberately malicious or something, nor am I trying to accuse them of intentional preferential treatment. The desire to run a zine with your friends can feel like the easiest, most reliable option, because you feel confident in your ability to trust and rely on those people. But I think that this practice is one of the biggest contributors to a lot of the problems in the zine community, even if that's the opposite of the intention of the people doing it. At the end of the day, there are a lot of problems with zines these days. But none of this is to say that they're bad or you shouldn't participate in them. There are flaws in any community or project, and my intention in bringing attention to them isn't to try to take a big shit on them. It's just to try to give some insight into why those problems are happening and how they're hurting people, so that hopefully things can improve in the future. Anyway, I am now 11 pages into what was supposed to be a five page script, so I'm gonna wrap it up. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video, or at least found it somewhat informative. And before I send you off, I would like to take a second to recommend my good buddy Fiona Paolo's video, because I do really want to encourage everyone watching to give zines a shot if they're interested in them, and I don't want my critique to turn them off of them altogether. Zines can be great, and the problems in the community shouldn't stop you from giving them a chance. And if you do decide to give them a chance, watch Apollo's video. It's linked in the card above, as well as the description. That way you can learn more about some of the biggest red flags to watch out for, and have the best zine experience possible and avoid some shittier ones. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. Special thank you as always to channel members Cafe Soleil and Joseph Solomon, as well as patrons Kyle Lowe, Batman, Blue Swanson, this is totally my name, Unity, and Cora Fear for their support, and I'll see you in the next one.